This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 169, recorded on January 18th, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. Nice to be with you. Welcome back. Happy New Year. Thank you. Same to you. You've been away a while, but we're happy that you're back. Thank you. Did, nice to be back. Did you <laughs> did you miss us? <laughs> oh boy, did I miss you. <laughs> my my first thought. <laughs> also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello, it's a bright and sunny day here in the north country. What is your temperature? How many degrees below zero? You know, we had a little bit of a warming trend. I think it was going to be in the mid twenties today, and currently yeah. it is twenty nine degrees Fahrenheit. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Where it's a beautiful, sunny 43 degrees with a chance of snow. <laughs> oh boy. Again, again. Well, that's winter for you, right? That's winter for us. Uh, so I have a person in my lab who is going to Auburn next week. And she said that they closed the university today because it was cold. <laughs> I can understand that. <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> no snow, just it was like 34 degrees, not even freezing. <laughs> they closed it for well, it cold. Maybe they don't have heat in the rooms. I don't know. Maybe. What's it, it like be. in New York City? Uh, it's um, well, this morning. It was below freezing. It was like I do Celsius, so it was like minus seven Celsius. Mm -hmm. Currently, is minus one. It's sunny, but uh, it's really cold. And uh, we had some a little more snow the other day. It's just been a tough winter because we had this Arctic air coming through. Yeah. Oh, well, that's weather. Speaking you know, you, you have to leak with Arctic and it. Antarctic air. <laughs> We're going to talk about <laughs> Antarctic air air today. That's a good one, Michelle. Very good. For the winter. <laughs> and the winter. The winter. That's right. After we do our papers for you, we are going to give away a book. I, I forgot what it even is. Disinfection, right? <laughs> yeah. A new one from ASM Press. Brand new book. So at the end of our discussion, uh, we'll give that away. We had seven entrants, so we'll give one of those lucky seven an amazing book on disinfection. But first, we have a snippet and a paper for you, and Michael is back with copper. I I'm back with copper. Um, the snippet <laughs> will actually reacquaint us with the concept of nutritional immunity that we covered about a year ago in TWIM 141 with Jennifer Baumberger, who talked with us about virus dysregulation of nutritional immunity. In today's paper, it's copper import in Escherichia coli with, by the Yersinia bactin metallophore system. And it was by uh, Co. Robinson, Bandara, Rogers, and Henderson. And it was published in September of 2017 in Nature Chemical Biology. And today's story is a riff on this broad concept of nutritional immunity, which is a process by which the host organism sequesters trace minerals in an effort to limit pathogenicity during infection. And so circulating concentrations of minerals such as iron and zinc decline rapidly and dramatically with inflammation associated with infection. Well, Covered, iron is it, the classic, isn't iron the classic? I mean, that's iron is Iron is the classic one involved in it. But I think in, in terms of how the host sequesters metals, I think this story with copper will begin to show us how important metals are to the to the microbial cell in terms of being able to do many important things. And they effectively function as coordination molecules in transport of metals into the cell. But today's story is a bit different where we learn about the role that this copper, which is an essential micro trace element, and its integral role as this cofactor in these functioning of these many redox enzymes that the microbial on the cells. Hand, on the other hand, at high concentrations or 
at medium concentration is highly toxic. That's right. And that's the cool part of this paper. It's this right. tour de force between toxic and what it needs. And it, it's it's really a, a neat story. They lay it out beautifully. And so I'm going to try to take us through this fairly quickly. So I apologize since it's only a snippet, but I think you'll get the gist of things as, as we go through. First, the nutrient part. In E. coli, there's one copper-based enzyme that you might imagine would be important as a virulence factor, and that's the amine oxidase. And it goes by the the abbreviation TYNA, which is a primary amine oxidase that catalyzes the breakdown of aromatic over aliphatic amines and able to deaminate molecules such as phenethylamine to phenethylacetaldehyde and the other waste products, ammonia and peroxide. And copper is required for that enzyme's activities. So the advantage that copper provides is that it serves as a necessary metal cofactor, making those enzymes work, which in turn enables the cell to grade, degrade amines like amino acids, which is in essence how E. coli can utilize all the protein that's surrounding it in this infection process. And in this case, the authors grow their initial cultures in lysogeny broth or luria broth, depending on which one you attribute it to. Then they switch out to a minimal medium in which they can begin to dissect it. The toxin part of the story is, of course, what got me interested in this paper. And I'll get to the toxin issue in a few minutes. But in the end, the authors are very much interested in this because urinary tract infections are the second most common bacterial infections of humans, counting for 8.6 million physician visits each year and over a million hospitalizations. And an acute uncomplicated cystitis or this inflammation of the bladder caused by E. coli is responsible for one of the most common indications for prescribing antimicrobials. And what I don't think most people appreciate is that in otherwise healthy women, before they reach their 32nd birthday, at least half of the women will exper have experienced at least one urinary tract infection. And so that's just phenomenal. There's a, there's a great discrimination between E. coli UTIs in women and their, until they you know, until the male-female ratio gets into the age 60 goes, or so. It goes with the anatomy, doesn't it? It goes with the anatomy. And, and so UTIs, and that's where this group of workers are in at Washington uh, University in St. Louis. They're all associated with looking at urinary tract infections. So we know infected hosts control the chemical composition of different anatomical environments to limit the microbial growth and prominent amongst these changes is withholding metal ions. And so you can take a look at TWIM 141 and learn about the canonical version with iron restriction. And the way the microbes get around this is with the production of siderophores, things that can scavenge metals. And uh, it's, if you will, the yin and the yang between the host and the pathogen. In the uropathogenic E. coli, the prominence virul virulence factor associated with this urinary tract infections is Yersinia bactin. And as its name implies, Yersinia bactin, or they abbreviate it YBT, along with Enterobactin, which comes from E. coli and the other enterics, collectively harvest the iron being stingily withheld by the host. So you can when think you of get them as super strong magnets. That's it. it it's they really pull the, pull the iron to the bacterial cell. And, and they need it for everything. They need it to make DNA. They need it to make all sorts of things. And when an uncomplicated genome associated with these organisms that cause UTIs and they compare the rectal E. coli to the urinary tract E. coli, they learn that the urinary strain is more likely to carry this 30 kilobase Yersinia high pathogenicity island. And we haven't talked on TWIM much about pathogenicity islands, but they're really accessory genes that the microbes 
pick up and they carry because it confers a selective advantage to them in this particular niche. And the YPT production or this Yersinia Bactin, its production is coordinated by this sophisticated multi-operon Yersinia high pathogenicity island that these uropathogenic E. coli have acquired either through a phage or through uh, conjugation with another organism in which it, it comes along. By the way, this, this brings up my favorite subject, which is horizontal gene transfer, because the, the very existence of pathogenicity islands indicates that very important functions in, in virulence, but otherwise also are transmitted from bacterium to bacterium horizontally, which I think is one of the great findings of the, what? The, Matter half 20, of the, the end of the 20th century. Yeah. century. Yeah. And their prevalence in the urinary tract E. coli predicts then that there are fitness advantages encoded on this particular island for Absolutely. the urinary tract. And the, the bottom line to this story is it's this Yersinia bank then that actually confers one of these advantages because it not only enables it to scrounge iron from the stingy host, but it also enables it to get copper, which is important in all sorts of redox balance enzymes in the cell, in addition to the amine enzyme that I have already introduced you to. So Let earlier work. Question. Sure. Me ask you, copper is both essential and toxic. At How the does same the time. cell know to, regu to regulate its amount? Because too much is bad, too little is no good. And that's how they're beginning to, te they don't have that whole story yet. And so I'm going to jump to the toxic part. So recall that when copper ions get inside the cell, the copper ion participates as a catalytic metal in the component of the Fenton reaction, where copper plus one is oxidized to copper plus two. That What's in the turn, name of the reaction again? What's the name the of it? F-E-N-T-O-N. You probably remember it oh, yeah. using iron. And right. so the Fenton reaction is this extreme oxidative force. And what it does is the metals, whether it be iron two going to iron three or copper one going to copper two, that oxidation of the metal converts the endogenously produced hydrogen peroxide. And all metabolism produces hydrogen peroxide as a consequence of dumping the waste electrons as quickly as they can. And hydrogen peroxide is a, a common waste product of metabolism. And what the Fenton reaction does is it converts hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, into one part singlet hydroxy ion and one part hydroxyl. They, in turn, wreak havoc in the cell by destroying nucleic acid, proteins, membrane proteins, the membrane, and, and they just bleach everything. It, it, it leach it, it just havoc. And so that's effectively how when copper ions get inside the cell, they do their dirty deed. And the story that these authors take us on is they show us, first and foremost, that the Yersinia bactin binds the metal. And they first give us some background and a recent study by one of the authors that was published in May of 2016 in Infection and Immunity, so that's a free download because it's a year later, is that cells lacking this Yersinia bactin in an experimental urinary tract model had a marked virulence defect. That is, those cells that didn't have this pathogenicity island with this particular molecule weren't able to compete. They, they weren't as virulent as the wild type. And my suspicion is that even though when they were put in this model, but when they grew them in minimal medium, they were able to restore this trait, if you will, of, of the cell being able to grow vigorously. And my suspicion is that there was enough iron being provided through the minimal medium because you always have plenty of iron in minimal medium. And, and copper sometimes is a contaminant associated with iron compounds because they sort of go hand in glove in terms of where you find copper and where you find iron. 
is that it was probably getting enough iron and iron's needed in a higher concentration. So in this study, they used the same strain, uh, UTI-89. So in addition to having uh, the Yersinia bactin pathogenicity island, urinary tract 89, the strain, has also enterobactin and a salmonella siderophore, salmonella chelin. And uh, these strains are typically grown in lysogeny broth. They're happy and uh, it all goes together. And the two last pieces of previous data that you need to know before we walk through the paper is that Previous data has shown that there's 15-fold more copper-2 YBT complexes than iron-3 YBT complex in the infection models. So it seems that this YBT molecule… Would you, would you explain that? That's a little bit, that's a little bit murky. The, my suspicion is, is that the affinity of the Yersinia bactin is greater for copper than it is for iron or ah. or the two strains, enterobactin, the two other siderophores that the strain has, enterobactin and Samella chelin, have a higher affinity for iron than they do the copper. And so it and I didn't have time to look up all the equilibrium kinetics of those three siderophores to know which had a greater affinity for what. So there's a lot going on, and since this was only a snippet, I don't want to go down that particular rabbit hole because I'm already giving you a lot of background that you need to appreciate the elegance of their study. And the second fact that you got to remember is that for many years, it was thought that E. coli lacked a copper import system which prompted the authors to pose the question whether or not these uropathogenic E. coli could even import mm. copper with this Yersinia bactin complex. And was it then the nutritional source of copper during infections? Now, the jump that these authors made from the time of their INI paper is they began to use quantitative mass spectroscopy in order to uh, do some of the experiments. And so they can do everything quantitatively with the mass spec and follow things along. And so using quantitative mass spec, they found that this uropathogen can quantitatively convert copper two in this Yersinia bactin complex during growth in low copper conditions. And then they cleverly used radioactive copper 64 radio labeling, and they found that the FYUA YPTPQ import system, so you have a outer membrane protein, which is FYUA, and then the inner membrane system, YPTPQ, effectively get together and collectively they bring the copper in and then release the copper slowly into the cy cytoplasm. Maybe that's the answer of how copper can be you, be good and bad. It is if you re bring it in and release it slowly, you have a mechanism for ensuring that it's the right low amount. Or they're segregating it, and, and they, they don't have it completely worked out. There's uh, other membrane proteins involved, but they're beginning to show us a glimpse of things. So... Their first set of experiments confers that this copper Yersinia bactin complex forms during low copper concentrations. And it's a really cool experiment in that what they have done is they take these urinary tract 89 cells that have been grown in minimal broth and they ask the question, how much copper can you buy? And so they show us a nice graph showing us the total YPT and then how much copper is bound to it. So the cell is making much more YPT than it actually needs. And you could make the argument that it really is copper is just a secondary actor and it's really making all this YPT for maybe iron. But the next aspect of their experiment is when they up – the concentration of copper in the medium by supplementing it with copper sulfate, they then see a significant increase in the amount of YPT made. And more importantly, every molecule of copper they add to that medium 
is sucked up by this complex. It's stoichiometric. You put five micromolars in, you get five micromolars bound to this complex. It's, it's phenomenal. And then they ask the question, is it toxic? And it had no effect whatsoever on the viability. None whatsoever. The, the viable counts look equivalent. You can't even see the error bar. So that was a really cool experiment that they did to show that this Yersiniobactin may really want the mm -hmm. copper and it makes enough of it to actually protect that cell. And what this showed me was that the cell does not like copper at all. It wants to keep it in this straight jacket molecule locked up tight. And, and it, it was just remarkable. And, and the third piece of data they showed out of that. So it's kind of like a buffer acting like it, a buffer it, for the mm -hmm. cell. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so there's a lot of cool concepts that they introduce the reader to and, and you can begin to see the remarkable aspects of the mechanism of how the cell protects itself. And remember, this is all related back to a pathogenic model. So this then sets up the hypothesis that the pathogenic bacteria may be able to benefit from being able to access copper from the copper two YPT complex to support its nutritional demands during infection. And one of the things that uh, pathogens have to constantly defend themselves against is all these redox insults that are being manifested by white blood cells. You know, they're getting superoxide thrown at them. They're getting all of these things. And all of those things are metal dependent enzymes. So we now transition to their second set of experiments that shows us that these, this uropathogenic E. coli dissociates the copper two YPT complex, and then it can regenerate the YPT without any penalty. So normally some cells bring metals in and they destroy the carrier in order to get the metal off of the carrier. And what that experiment shows us is that doesn't happen. And they go through nice detail using another K-12 typical lab strain. And the experiment is that they take two strains, they grow them to a relatively high density, 0.8 optical density units. And I sort of object when people just write an OD. So I put into the show notes a handy dandy cheat sheet of converting <laughs> OD 0.8 to CFUs per mil. So that's about 6.4 times 10 to the 8. And one of the molecular biology companies has out there a handy dandy conversion to figure out what OD and E. coli mean in terms of cells per, per mil. Depending so they, on the growth media, right? Right. And they, they are using the standard lysogeny broth. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, a, it's a kosher way uh, of looking at them. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they grow them in to relatively high density. They resuspend them into a minimal medium, and they incubate them for two hours, at which time they ask the question whether or not E. coli expressing this pathogenicity island, operon, are capable of dissociating both copper YPT and iron YPT complexes. And the answer was yes. They did this cleverly with uh, stable isotope C13, and they made the complexes. And since they were using a mass spec, they could tell if it was getting in and whether the metal was free at the end. They then take us to the bread and butter experiment is where they address whether the copper two complex and dissociation required the membrane components. Uh, the, mem the outer membrane component recall is FYUA and then the inner membrane compartments are these YPT PQ companions. Again, they use their LC MSMS to measure the concentration of the YPT complexes. And they did a clever thing where they overproduced the membrane component, the two independent mem membrane components, and they had mutant cells in which they produced the outer membrane one and the inner membrane one. And you could tell where things were going. And they tell us that in order to measure YPT and E. coli, they had to do this ectopically where they express these outer membrane proteins, FRUA, and then the inner membrane one, YPTPQ. And the two proteins were expressed in this mutant 
UTI 89 delta YPTA, which is then transcriptionally silent. So they're doing a lot of sexy genetics. And in this mutant, they exogenously supply the YPT complex with copper, the YPT complex with iron, or the YPT complex with gallium. And gallium is very similar in size and shape and function to iron, but you cannot reduce gallium at physiological pHs. It, it, the pH isn't right. So gallium, if it's bound to it, will, will never come off. Mm. And I love the way they organized their figure. It was just easy to follow along. And they tell us that in the mutant exogenously supplied with YPT complex with copper, iron, or gallium, it remained extracellular and never got in. So they needed the either the membrane piece or both membrane pieces in order to get in. So in their next mutant, so you're just going in their figure. The first one is the mutant with everything taken away. And then the next one is you're adding the outer membrane one, and that will allow the cell to grab the YPT complex with whatever metal it has and transfer it from the outer membrane to the periplasm. So when it goes from the outer membrane to the periplasm, it's inside. It's effectively sequestered so they can precipitate it down and, and find it as opposed to be remain in the medium. And it just literally lines up. And then finally, the third mutant co-expressing A and YPTPQ, the copper was taken from the medium and cells while increasing the metal that was free. And then you got the free YPT back where the YPT returned back into the environment, showing us that the cell was recycling its siderophore. So it just was a, a really, and to a redox lover like me, to get reacquainted with how siderophores are able to carry out their tasks, the gallium experiment was sort of like the icing or whipped cream on the cake. Where That was, that was a great reagent to have. Oh, it, it was just fantastic. And, you know, overall, without going into all of the gory details of the remaining experiments where they effectively demonstrate what you expect is, is the copper that is transported in is indeed the nutritional source of copper. And that nutritional source is this copper Yersinia Bactin complex. And they finish things off with a neat model showing us that this UPC, this urinary uropathogenic E. coli can use this YPT system to acquire the copper to support the copper-dependent enzyme activity. And it's a really cool model showing the copper binding to the YPT. That then gets stuck to the cell and is only brought in when the cell effectively has the right set of circumstances. And it's a tightly regulated operon based on the concentration of copper so it doesn't get too high. And they still have a little black box around the YPT-PQ reduction and how it makes certain, going back to what Elio said, how do we control how much copper is actually brought into that cell? And I guess that's where we say stay tuned and hope they figure that out because that, of course, then will give us new drug targets. And that's where you go back to how do you deal with this in a urinary tract infection where you may not necessarily want to use antibiotics to treat everything. You may want to effectively lie to the cell and steal its copper or, or control its iron akin to what the host does with nutritional immunity. So the snippet is one worth reading. It's real easy to get to, uh, get through, I should say. And um, Michael, could you yeah. control copper locally like that? I mean, you, so you don't want to take it, your, all your copper away to treat a urinary tract infection, right? Could you, no. could you limit it just in the bladder, say? And in fact, funny you should ask, there are studies being done presently mm -hmm. as I was reading around and how I stumbled into it. There are copper nanoparticles out there now ah. doing, <laughs> wow. doing effectively, uh, they're, they're looking at copper nanoparticles to do toxicity. Yeah. And at the same time, they're looking at copper sinks 
to effectively suck up the copper. So yeah, yeah. I think I, you know, you could figure out how you could chelate it to something that you as because the bladder is amenable to uh, depositing something in to to steal the the metals away yeah. to to starve the cell. So you could imagine putting something in and inflating it so it stays in there. Yeah. And then you take it out when it's done or maybe it dissolves or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Or you and naturally pass it. Maybe. Yeah. 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 It's got to stay long enough, obviously, to work. So mm-hmm. that's interesting. Neat. Lovely um, use of genetics. Yes. To take it step by step through the mechanism. Yeah. I like that. I like when they do well, that. Michelle asked for a mechanism paper, so I, I went hunting. <laughs> When Michelle says jump, Michael says how high. (laughs) She's she's our president-elect. That's right. Oh, please. Are you going to be president this summer? Is that when you get inaugurated? Um, July 1 would be the the normal. Yep. Very good. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. We have another paper which will be in tune with the weather here. (laughs) Weather across the country. Actually, across the country last week, apparently it was on one day, it was below zero in every state. Wow. Including Hawaii, I guess up on the mountain there, it was also freezing. And so this paper will um, play into that coldness. It's a letter published in Nature called Atmospheric Trace Gases Support Primary Production in Antarctic Desert Surface Soil. So you think of Antarctic, you're probably thinking snow and ice, but it's not all snow and ice there happens to be the coldest and driest climate on Earth, but there is a terrestrial ecosystem. Some parts have large areas of uh, uncovered rock, and there there's very limited resources. There's limited carbon, there's limited nitrogen, water, and there's lots of UV. In fact, that's one of the places on Earth where the UV is crazy high because there's not a lot of coverage for it. And, of course, there's freeze-thaw cycles, freezes and thaws and freezes and thaws. No trees, no shrubs in these areas that are uh, desert, but there are plants, there are nematodes, there are insects and snails, mites, spiders, birds, other things, and there are bacteria and fungi. I think tardigrades, too. Am I saying that right? Tardigrade. Tardigrades. Tardigrades, yeah. They got to be there. They're too (laughs) cool not to be. (laughs) No, they mentioned them specifically in this paper. I I remember that. So this is all about the um, microbial communities in this terrestrial ecosystem. And people previously have studied the the desert soils. There are rich microbial communities in these soils, but many of the microbes are dormant. And whatever energy they can make, they use for maintenance, to stay alive, not to grow. They're not not worried about dividing. They're worried about staying alive. And the real question is, where do they get the energy for this? There's not a lot of carbon in the soil. There are not a lot of primary producers. So a lot of these ecosystems down there in Antarctica, very low abundance of cyanobacteria, you know, which would be uh, used doing photosynthesis to make materials that other uh, animals could use and other microbes, but they're not there. So here they set out to find how these ecosystems, how these microbial communities are supported. And they used a combination of metagenomics, doing sequencing of soil samples, and they do some biochemistry, actually do some biochemical experiments. It was a great combination of nice? those two yeah. approaches. Yeah, I mean, really. It's nice. The metagenomics is great, but when they then take it a step further, as you'll see, it's very cool. So these are, uh, they in this paper, they study sample surface soil samples from a few locations, which as far as I can tell, uh, seem to be on the coast of uh, Antarctica. They have some pictures in the supplementary data. And by the way, if you want to get there, you can't fly there. You have to take a boat from South America, and it takes a while. And I just, uh, Dixon de Pommier's wife just went on a vacation, and um, you fly to South America, then you take a boat, and it takes a couple of days to get to Antarctica. And I think you, if you're, if you're a tourist, you stay on the boat. You can't traipse around. But <laughs> Hey, Vincent, did you um, already say who, who did this work and where they are? I didn't. I forgot to say that. It's, um, it's, it's a wonderful consortium from the Australian Center for Astrobiology, from the Monash University, the University of Queensland, Wirekai Research Center, and the Australian Antarctic Division 
of the Department of Sustainability, Environment, Water, and Population and Communities. And the first author is Mukanji and Chris Greening, uh, Von Wantergam, Carrere, Bay, Steen, Montgomery, Lines, Beardold, Van Dorst, Snape, Stott, Hugenholtz, and Ferrari. I get so excited about the paper, I forgot to say who I did know. it. I know. But what reminded me <laughs> is that, of course, the continent of Australia is close to the continent of Antarctic. Uh, yeah, close so. as in, you know, a <laughs> couple of days <laughs> close, away, right? Closer than us. Yeah. <laughs> well, the the other thing that I think most folks may not instantly appreciate is that Antarctica is about a third of the size of Asia. And Asia is the largest continent. Yeah, it's big. And we don't think about it very much, right? It's no, kind of, no. Antarctica mean, is huge. If it's you think just, about it. Yeah, it's, it's huge, but uh, it's out of sight, out of mind pretty much. But uh, there's some interesting stuff going on down there. All right. So they have soil samples. The first sample is from a place called Robinson Ridge. Get some surface soil and they, they analyze it. They show it. There's very low carbon, nitrogen, and water in it. And then they extract the nucleic acid. They sequence it. And they make a shotgun genome from uh, this soil, 264 million bases, which contains, after analysis, 208,233 genes that they can pick up. And the microbial communities are mainly actinobacteria, chloroflexi, proteobacteria, acidobacteria, and then two candidate phyla, which are called AD3 and WPS2. The only prototrophs they identified were cyanobacteria phototrophs, were cyanobacteria, but very low abundance, only 0.28% of all the, the reeds. Uh, it's fair to say that this spectrum mm -hmm. of, of bacteria is kind of unusual, right? Yes. This is not mm -hmm. what you find in other soils. This is not your usual soil microbiome for sure. Yeah. This is because it's an unusual ecosystem. It's very harsh and uh, this is apparently adapted to be able to exist there. Yeah. It serves as a model for Martian studies, doesn't it? It probably it does. does. Yeah. Can, that, can anyone comment on chloroflexi? I don't, I'm not familiar with this uh, collection. I think it's a gliding bacterium, if I'm remembering right, that actually has chlorophyll. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now they have 280,000 genes. What are they? They want to know what's the metabolic potential. And you can analyze your genes and say what are, the, what are they encoding and what can they do. Um, and so all of they constructed 23 genomes from all of their data. And all of these 23 encoded terminal oxidase genes, which are needed to do aerobic respiration. And they also have genes to oxidize organic carbon compounds. Uh, in these actinobacteria, WPS2 and AD3, they found genes for carbon dioxide fixation by the Calvin cycle. Now, remember, this is a light independent cycle that converts carbon dioxide to glucose. And one of the enzymes of this cycle is Rubisco, ribulose 1,5-biphosphate carboxylase. The most abundant enzyme on planet Earth. Is that right? It is indeed. It's, well, it's thought well, to be. Well. I don't know if that takes in all the <laughs> microbes that we're now studying, but. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's probably true. But remember, we, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of um, blue-green algae on planet Earth. Right, right, right. So this it's is how uh, plants capture CO2 yeah, and convert it right. into sugars. Yeah, so that's the key enzyme there to capture carbon dioxide and adds it to the first compound, ribulose 1,5-biphosphate. Uh, and um, this, uh, is also, this enzyme is also known to support growth of actinobacteria and um, using hydrogen as a source of energy. So this, uh, genes encoding this enzyme were found in, uh, in, in many of these microbes. They also found enzymes for aerobic respiration of molecular hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And these are very high affinity enzymes that can scavenge these gases, which are present uh, at trace levels in the atmosphere. So you have high affinity enzymes that can grab them. They also found enzymes, genes encoding enzymes in using methane as a carbon source, uh, genes for proteins that are involved in ammonia oxidation, nitrogen cycling, and 
tolerance of low temperatures because it gets pretty cold down there. Uh, but they did not find enzyme for photosynthesis. They do not. That's right. And that is a key point because if they were, what's the big deal? They'd just be dealing with yes. photosynthetic bacteria. That's right. But this is not the case. So this is what the big news is. They we're not dealing with photosynthesis, but something else. What could it be? Right, so that's the question. No, no photosynthetic genes because there's not a lot of light. And so how are these cells, these microbial cells surviving? Right, that's the key What question. are they eating? Is what are they the, eating? the question at hand. It's what everybody goes home at dinner. What's for dinner? And so that's the theory here, that based on what genes they found in these organisms, they suggest that the surface soil microbes here in Antarctica can scavenge hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide from the atmosphere to get their energy and their carbon from. All right. Amazing. You could this, just... But what's amazing <laughs> is not only that this is a new kind of new metabolism, right. if you wish, but that it works on such slow concentration of gases. Very low. There's not a lot of hydrogen. There's not a lot of carbon monoxide. Yeah. Carbon dioxide doesn't count because that's what's being... It's what's being fixated. It sort of violates Henry's law, which says gas does never want to go back into liquid. And since all the chemistry of the cell is is effectively aqueous, right. you know, it, it it's really remarkable that it's able to concentrate these gases, which are in low concentration out of the atmosphere, into making more cells. Exactly. Exactly. And they of course, do what they, they can, right? There's these, not a lot of glucose and, and so these, <laughs> carbon laying around. These gases can permeate the, the cell membranes, right? So that's one of the right. properties they have, which makes them available uh, to these bacteria. So next they do, they do some experiments to show that their theory might be correct. First, they extract RNA from the soil and they do reverse transcriptase PCR and show that the genes encoding Rubisco and the high affinity hydrogenase and carbon monoxide hydrogenases, they're expressed in the soil. They can see uh, that the RNA is there by, by amplifying it as DNA. And they also use gas chromatography to show that uh, the soil communities can aerobically oxidize atmospheric hydrogen and carbon monoxide. All right. Next, they did a cool experiment. They have C14 labeled CO2. <laughs> now, there's a compound you have to be careful with. C14 labeled, carbon-14 labeled CO2. They take their soil samples, they add the C14 CO2 to them, and they incubate it, and they can measure the uptake of carbon because it's labeled, it's isotopically labeled, uh, by uptake uh, into the, the microbial communities. And they find low uptake, and they, they tried this with soil from several different sites, and the amount of uptake is variable. But if they added hydrogen, they could stimulate the uptake of the labeled carbon dioxide. So that's consistent with their idea. And if they shine light on it, it doesn't matter. Again, there's no photosynthesis going on. So I was in touch with the two first authors, Mukan mm -hmm. and Chris Ge Greening, and they both said that this was the most exciting part of this oh, yeah, the three C14 and four year long the, project yeah. when they actually did the enzymatic studies of the soil and found, you know, before their eyes, these cool reactions happening. So did they take that back somewhere else and back to Australia and do that, or they did it in C2 in, in uh, Antarctica? So they brought the soil samples back to labs. Um, the grass, gas chromatography experiments were actually led by Carlo Carrier and Matt Scott, and they're at the GNS Science Institute in New Zealand. Um, so they did that. And then Professor John Beardall who is, uh, was described as an esteemed algal physiologist, he's the person that conducted the carbon um, fixation experiments. So both of them pointed out that this project is really the fruition of a terrific collaboration between a variety of people at different institutions that all had expertise, and they brought it together and really brought these soil samples to life um, mm. in this paper. Cool. Yeah. They looked at these, the metagenomics, they did a little carbon fixation studies with samples from other sites, a couple of sites throughout Antarctica. So they get an idea that this is, this happens not just at one place, but in, in multiple places in Antarctica, there are back microbial communities that can uh, oxidize trace atmospheric gases. And they did some calculations, which are interesting. Um, and they, they figure that oxidation of hydrogen and carbon monoxide could sustain microbial communities from five to eight 
times 10 to the seventh bacteria per gram of soil. Not bad. Not too bad. Oh, wow. Right? Not shabby. Just breathing, <laughs> just taking air, <laughs> right? Um, and so, the, again, these they feel the primary producers, which are doing this, taking atmospheric acids, are actinobacteria, AD3, and WPS2 phyla. And again, they, they make biomass from atmospheric hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Um, and they propose the name, names for these two phyla, Candidatus eremiobacterieto for the desert bacterial phylum, and Candidatus dormibacteriota for dormant bacterial phylum for WPS2 and AD3. So kind of cute names, right, <laughs> for those mm-hmm. two. Um, so basically these, as, as Alio implied before, these extreme uh, ecosystems, physically extreme and chemically deprived sites, they have microbial communities that have been shaped uh, by the ability of, of things to live there. And they're dormant, heterotrophic aerobic bacteria that oxidize atmospheric gases. Um, and there aren't many phototrophs because there's not much water and nu- nutrient availability. It's very dark and there's a lot of radiation. That's the other part that's a problem. There's there's some evidence from other studies. I thought this was cool that wind can bring microbes from other less hostile sti- sites. And then selection only brings out the ones that can sc- scavenge uh, trace gases. And this might be a mm-hmm. general mechanism of survival. One thing they brought up, which I thought was really interesting, um, there are some parts of Antarctica where there are lots of phototrophs and the soil is moist, so it does support photosynthesis. And these include hypolithons. These are phototrophic microbes that live underneath rocks. Right? The rocks protect them from UV light, but the rocks are translucent so the bacteria can get the light wow. that they need to do photosynthesis. How about specialization? Isn't that amazing? So they're filtering out the bad yeah. so they get the good. Because yeah, you don't want UV light, right? It's just when you take probably- your genome. They're probably eating the the red spectrum of the energy scale. You know, that's where a lot of bacterial yeah, photosynthesis yeah, is yeah. down in the red zone. So they end up by saying most ecosystems, you know, are driven by solar or geologically derived energy. In these Antarctic soils, it's it's by atmospheric trace gases. Incredible. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? Incredible. I mean, this is like a grand alternative to photosynthesis. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like discovering a mechanism that's equivalent to photosynthesis because it uses atmospheric gases. You know, so I, uh, it's just amazing. They found that these reactions too happen even at minus twelve degrees. That's right. Yeah. Oh my so, god. So the the possibility then, you know, your imagination just goes wild. Um, at, we talked about Mars earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe this is how life got its start in extreme planets. I mean, we should point out that these bacteria are are just getting by, right? They're not, they're not right, right, dividing right. crazily, right? But they're they're existing, and you know, presumably in some periods they do divide and so forth. But most of the time, they're just maintaining themselves. The other exciting implication is: could we now use these pathways to generate energy from gases? Mm-hmm. That's a new energy source. Yeah. like solar or wind. You could imagine putting them into smokestacks to take out the waste CO, yeah. you know, effectively yeah. <laughs> filter out the carbon monoxide so that yeah. uh, we're dealing with it. And at the same time, fixing CO2. So yeah. you, you killed the proverbial two birds with the one system. Yep. I was wondering in terms of future work, uh, it'd be nice to see, to know what these bugs look like. And so it's not easy to do, but since you have specific genes, you can make specific probes and you could look under the microscope of things that light up with certain probes. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in what what these bugs would look like. I imagine they're very small because most environmental bugs are very tiny. Right. (laughs) <laughs> I bet they are. Interesting. We don't even know if they're the if they're gram negatives. That is, they have an outer membrane and a periplasm oh, no. and an inner membrane. I don't, with a I don't think relative. they learn anything about the bugs themselves, do they? No. Not well, yet. Yeah, these are the genes. I mean, this for, is this is paper number one. Yeah. 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 And I should say, just to uh, to end this, that there are a group of people who believe that humans can survive on air alone. And they are called they are? they are called breatharians. <laughs> I never heard of them. Neither did I until I was looking up 
stuff. I'll tell I you think, what, I wouldn't I think that's an ad long. for weight loss, isn't it? <laughs> um, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather have my dinner than being a vegetarian. <laughs> Me so too. I'd like to share a bit about two of the scientists sure. who led this project. Mukon Ji got her Bachelor's of Science in Molecular Biotechnology at the University of Sydney, and then she earned both her Master's and PhD with Belinda Ferrari, who's the senior author on this at the University of New South Wales. She wanted to share advice that collaboration is extremely important. This paper really required some collaborations with um, very different expertise, and they were incredibly talented. She also said that you need to look at your data from many different angles. She said the project had its origin back in 2013, and they you know, went down a few different avenues. But finally, in 2015, they got some key results and just figured out where they wanted to take it. Um, so she was encouraging junior scientists to be open-minded about, about the data you have. So um, Yukon had a very productive uh, thesis research career. She published eight papers, and she also married and gave birth to their daughter during that time. Wow. She's currently a postdoc at the Institute of Tibetan Plateau Research, which is within the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So the other co-first author is Chris Greening. He's currently a group leader and a Discovery Early Career Researcher awardee at Monash University in Australia. He got his bachelor's and master's at Oxford studying heme biosynthesis enzymes in paracoccus, and then his PhD at the University of Otega in New Zealand with Gregory Cook. And there he became an expert in nickel iron hydrogenases of Mycobacterium smegmatis, which, like these microbes we talked about today, is famous for its ability to persist in low nutrient environments. He describes himself as a biochemist at heart, and he had predicted, based on his work with Mycobacterium smegmatis, that some microbes could capture trace gases and use them as energy sources. So he was huh. thrilled when he got an wow. email from Belinda Ferrari, who was aware of his thinking and expertise and who recruited him to join this project. And for him, it was an easy sell. He was amazed that they had 22 reconstructed bacterial genomes from the Robinson Ridge, and they all had genes for oxidation of trace gases in the atmosphere, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane. So he, as I said, the most exciting moment was the gas chromatography when they saw that the soil was actually consuming these gases at really high rates and even at low temperatures, because he points out that for much of the 19th century, we thought the whole continent was basically sterile. And here mm. they had direct evidence that that was not the case. So advice he has for colleagues, um, junior colleagues especially. Well, wait a minute. I, I, I have to make a comment. Uh, I sure. was amazed at the address. Chris Greening works at the School of Biological Sciences, Center for Geometric Biology at Monash. Mm -hmm. Somebody tell me what geometric biology is? <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to learn I have from no Chris. Clue. They <laughs> invented a term which may be very useful, but I wish that I could find a definition of it. Hmm. So Probably his advice, in their mission statement. Oh, that's true. <laughs> we could look it up on the World Wide Web. He says uh, to be successful, he's um, been willing to challenge established ideas. We certainly saw that here. Um, and also to collaborate. So again, he wanted to give credit to um, their collaborators, Career and Matt Scott for the gas chromatography and John Birdall, who did the carbon fixation. He also has taken a goal-centric approach to publishing and career development and he encourages other people to do that, be really proactive. And of course, he says a massive passion for science has to underlie everything we do. Mm, you got it, for sure. So according to the internet, geometric biology allows us to understand the dynamics of how living things convert energy flows into mass at all mm. scales of biological organizations. The size and shape together, the geometry of organisms ultimately determine these flows. So that's effectively what this paper did. It was geometric biology. Yep. It's cool. Wow. Learn something every day. You bet. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Thanks for choosing this paper. I thought it was just a really a gee whiz kind Very of cool. result. Very cool. Neat. This is really an exceptional paper. There's no questions. Mm. It's a trailblazer. Yeah. However, I do not want to go to Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> it does not inspire in me any desire to go. I, especially looking at the pictures, it looks pretty barren. 
But it's harder to complain about our cold spell, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's true. Let me read you some of these emails we received. Uh, last episode, I said we're going to give a book away, Disinfection, read a brand new ASM book. We got seven emails. I will pick one at random by generating a random number. Tim writes the first one. My name is Tim, a current high school senior in Connecticut and a new listener to TWIM. You guys are truly inspiring the next generation of scientists with what you do. This book would be an excellent read for me since I'm planning to major in microbiology with a specialization in infectious diseases starting in the fall. As you know, one can't research microbes if they don't know how to kill them. And it just, <laughs> Tim. If you don't know what? If you don't know how to kill them. <laughs> Anthony writes, please enter this email in the contest with the hygiene hypothesis in mind. For disinfection, too much of a good thing is not wonderful. And Anthony sends along a poem by Arthur Gwitterman called Strictly Germ Proof. I will just read the first few lines. You can find the rest in the letters section. The antiseptic baby and the prophylactic pup were playing in the garden when the bunny gambled up. They looked upon the creature with a loathing undisguised. It wasn't disinfected and it wasn't sterilized. <laughs> so if you want to hear the rest, go to the letters at microbe.tv slash twim. Brian writes, Dear cast of Twim, I enjoy hearing your program from time to time through the TuneIn app on my iPhone. Here in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, Canada, we have ascended out of a two-week deep freeze and are basking in minus 13 Celsius. <laughs> I come from an agricultural background and was raised on a farm of milk and honey, so I took an interest in the program about the cultures found in the noses of dairy farmers. I also must have contracted cowpox when we milked cows by hand, since the medical people tried several times to inoculate me with the smallpox vaccine, and I never reacted. I have no scar. That is so cool. You're right. That, is, that would do it. immunization. That would do it. How cool is that? I have a degree in agricultural science from Guelph, specializing in honeybees. We run a thousand hives on our family farm. Wow. Since 1988, when my brother bought the farm from my father and myself, he has successfully run 5,000 colonies annually. He's not experiencing colony collapse and winter losses. He attributes his success to the knowledge that parasitic mites resident in and on the bees are introducing viruses that cause bees to die over winter. Some beekeeping operations in the province lose 50% of their bees over winter, sometimes more. His winter losses have been 5% or less he believes that by treating the mites with a miticide early in the spring, while none of the brood is capped but all the cells are open, he can effectively eradicate most of the mites. Consequently, most of the bees, including the queen, that go into the winter have not been bitten by the mites, are not sick from viruses, and can endure the long, cold months. Now, that is a hmm. really interesting idea. I listen with great interest to your program when I get a chance and marvel and how careful you are to keep it in lay terms. That language helps keep my interest, and I do learn some interesting facts almost every time. About 15 years ago, my wife became infected with herpes zoster in her eye. Sadly, no medical person offers any hope for stopping the damage. The scar has almost entirely covered her iris. Cold weather typical here in Saskatchewan winters, and the wind aggravate the condition. I wanted to ask if there has been any breakthrough that you could share with me so that she could receive helpful treatment. I would also enjoy hearing why she would be infected in one eye and that it has not spread to the other eye or to me. Thank you for considering me for the free book. Well, well, Vincent. Well, the thing is you get these herpes infections in the eye because you typically touch a lesion with your finger on mm -hmm. someone else and then you, then you put it in your eye. So it's typically one eye that you infect. And then it doesn't go to anyone else. It stays in that one eye because there's, there's, it's not easy to go from eye to eye, as you might imagine. Uh, and you don't spread it because you don't typically, people don't touch your eye typically, and that's how you would spread the infection to others. And unfortunately, there's nothing to be done. The, uh, the damage is actually an immune reaction to infection. It's not viral damage, but it's an immune reaction, and there's nothing really that can be done about it. Uh, next one is from Jacob. Because I never win anything, Jake. He's a postdoc <laughs> at MIT. Uh, one, and then Asaf writes, I've been a twin listener. Since episode one, it took a book contest to get me to write in. I work in a bioremediation company and would love to hear you talk about the subject, maybe a special guest. It's been five years since I completed my PhD, and TWIM has been my journal club. Helps keep my passion for bacteriology. 
<laughs> I have two questions for the listeners. One, for those who listen while driving, does any of you have an idea for not forgetting your twim questions by the time you get to your destination? <laughs> <laughs> Two, which Twim, Twiv, or Twip episodes should I recommend on a non-scientific Facebook group for podcast addicts? All right, those are listener questions, so please answer uh, Asaf. And thank you for making my every other Sunday morning so much better. Shalom from sunny Israel, where the week begins on Sunday. All right. One more from Sophia. Dear Twim team, Happy New Year. I never write, even though I've been listening since 2011. But always too long after the episode is out. But it's a new year and unusual things happen, like Dr. De Pommier being a guest. How nice. So I thought I'd do something original, too. You like to know where we listen from. So greetings from Thessaloniki, Greece, where the temperature is 10 degrees Celsius at the moment. Congratulations on all your podcasts. To be honest, I like how you've started talking about things that cross the podcast boundaries. Influenza on TWIM. Dengue on immune. This approach helps me understand things a lot. What a great idea. I hope you do it more often. Would you talk about TB sometimes in any podcast, actually? Have a wonderful year, and thank you for all your time and effort. All right. Wow, she really is a devotee. She understands from one podcast to the next Very what good. we're covering. Oh. All right, we had seven entries. I will do a random number generator. Here's the drum roll, and the number is five. The five is... Jake at MIT, who says he never wins anything. Well, here you go, Jake. You won something. <laughs> Jake, it's a happy new year. Jake, send us your address. Send it to twim at microbe.tv. And that's it for twim169. It's at asm.org slash twim. And send us your uh, emails, uh, twim at microbe.tv. And if you'd like to help us financially, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute to help us out. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. I enjoyed joining you all again. Welcome back. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Welcome back, Elio. My pleasure. Thank you. Good to have you. Michael Schmitz at the Univers Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of, of Twim and Ray Ortega for his technical help. Music on Twim is by Ronald Jenkies, ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. <laughs> <laughs>